Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer. Today I'm joined by American Identity Movement President and actually the movement CEO in general, Patrick Casey. Pat, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're glad to have you. I mean, it's hard to find you. You've been uh, banished by big tech. You, it's very hard to find Patrick in these days. He's been cast out into the wilderness, loaning, roaming the streets where he can find. I mean, because they're not, they don't allow him on Twitter. They don't allow him on YouTube. Don't allow him on Patreon, PayPal, or anything. He's a real hunted man, a punished, our punished movement CEO indeed. But we got a lot of topics. We'll We'll get to that in a moment. But first up, let's talk about the supposedly Marxist Black Lives Matter. Republicans and conservatives keep calling BLM a Marxist group. However, every corporation on earth supports BLM, and BLM doesn't appear to threaten capitalism at all. BLM seems to be more anti-white than anti-capitalism. Why do conservatives insist that BLM is Marxist and ignore its true nature? I think that the average conservative, and I don't mean – I'm, I'm not trying to condescend here – doesn't really have a solid grasp of what constitutes Marxism. And as such, they see any remotely left-wing – you just insulted all of my boomer fans. They're going <laughs> to – good luck. Well, they better, they better listen, to, they better listen up. They're getting yeah. back onto Twitter now. But continue, yeah. continue. Well, I mean I, I just – in short, I think that – it's, I, I can sympathize with and I understand why the average conservative would look at something that is destructive toward America and is antithetical to Western values and say that is Marxist. But uh, what we're up against just in general is not, is not Marxism. Uh, Black Lives Matter and, and you know, Jeff Bezos and George Soros, they're not trying to usher in the dictatorship of the proletariat. What we're up against is globalism or neoliberalism and these, these ruling ideologies make use of certain Marxist perspectives and talking points, but it's for cynical uh, economic and political gain. It's not, it's not actual. I don't think it's exactly what Karl Marx actually had in mind. Yeah, and they always rely on the supposed founders of the movement. And it's like these three women, you don't even really know their names. Like I can't even recall their names of who they said. And they said in like some video interview, they're like, oh, we're trained Marxists. And they're like, ha ha, this is it. This proves this is a Marxist group. Now, there is a positive to this. It does give Republicans and conservatives a reason to hate Black Lives Matter. As we've had people like Mitt Romney who are like, Black Lives Matter, I support it. And everyone's like, why don't you support Black Lives Matter? Do you not say that Black, are you saying Black Lives don't matter? It's the same with like Antifa. It's like, oh, you oppose Antifa? So you're for fascism? You know, it's these very stupid rhetorical weapons that they use to like get people to support things that like, Black Lives Matter is not whether you say Black Lives Matter. And clearly our society uh, thinks Black Lives do matter. In fact, they matter more than your life because, I mean, we're having nationwide riots and our whole social transformation because of one Black guy who's a convicted felon who's drugged up, having a heart attack. And also the worst genocide that's ever been perpetuated in this country is that nine unarmed Blacks died in the year of 2019. We cannot allow any unarmed Blacks to ever die in this country, even if they're using a car to try to run over a police officer. You know, they, we cannot allow that. So they, it does, it is one good thing is that it does say, it's like, okay, it's a boomer conservative talking point, but at least they're showing opposition to Black Lives Matter. But it'd be so much easier to actually identify what motivates Black Lives Matter. And it's black supremacy. You know, it feels, as I was saying, that Black Lives Matter more than yours. That's that's the real message of the movement. And they're viciously anti-white. I mean, you can look at anything that they say. It's like whites are the evil villains. They've done the worst crimes in history from slavery to colonialism. We must punish whites. They must give us reparations. It's like whites are inferior. Whites must shut their mouths and not say anything at their events. They must get on their stomachs and do I can't breathe in their act of atonement. It is insanely anti-white and it's based on the notions that whites and even like, you know, whites can't, <laughs> white communities are inherently evil. There's so many things that are just like, it's anti-white. I don't think the average Black Lives Matter person knows what Marxism is, much less who Mark, Karl Marx is, definitely has never read those books. I'm, not, I'm right. sure even the founders can't even define what Marxism would mean. And it does give them like 
the right or the mainstream right rather a reason to oppose them. But it, you know, they're so stuck in like the Cold War mentality is that they have to see everything as like communist uh, versus freedom. It's and a lot of the people who are promoting this are Gen Xers and boomers who, you know, they grew up in the Cold War and they still think of communists as the ultimate evil. And, you know, communism isn't really a valid ideology anymore. It's on the dustbin of history that they have to continue to resurrect it to attack current enemies when it's really not the case here. Yeah, I agree with basically everything that you said there. Um, to the extent that well, the thank average you. I mean, everyone should agree with everything I say. <laughs> yeah, you told me before I come on the show, I have to agree with your take. So I'm just, I'm just making it very yeah. clear. Now. You have to be like, yeah. great point, Scott. I have wow, never heard amazing, that amazing commentary. Yeah, well, I would just add on there. Yeah, uh, to the extent that people in Black Lives Matter support uh socialism or marxism they support it just be maybe in general because they think that they're going to get something out of it like oh socialism yeah yeah I, I get you know i profit from that but in terms of like marxist theory and you know socialism defined as marx and engels i would have defined it i don't think that really plays much uh if any of a role in black lives matter as you said it's absolutely defined by being anti-white before it's defined by being anti-capitalist uh it's focused on identity politics. And, you know, this isn't a, a particularly groundbreaking take at this point, but the whole woke ideology really just serves to cover up what our elites are up to. And that is uh, just, you know, destabilizing the country and consolidating power, money, and, uh, you know, control for themselves. So all of this really serves to that advantage, even if the people in Black Lives Matter aren't aware of it, uh, the effect is the same. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, one of the core fe features of Marxism is like its class-based analysis. And BLM is a definitely not a class-based movement whatsoever. It's entirely racially based. They want a redistrib redistribution of wealth, not among the classes, but between the races. They want to redistribute white wealth to blacks. Uh, that's the whole point of reparations. And every other thing that they that they support is that it's redistributing wealth and, and privilege from whites to blacks, it, they don't care about the proletariat. They they see working class whites as their primary enemy versus upper class whites. And most of the people who are joining in uh, with BLM protests. If they've seen, a, you know, they've done a lot of studies on these polls about, you know, various protests in like Atlanta and everywhere where there's a majority of white people who are there during the day. And even in Portland, which we'll talk about later on the podcast, you know, it. I don't think there's any black people in Portland protesting. It's like entirely white, but it's all these like middle class, upper class whites who are joining in and they don't feel that BLM is going to take away their wealth or, or request, you know, take their property and abolish it. They, it's just entirely race based. It's not anything about class war. It's all about race war for this movement. And, you know, Going along with like conservatives always like, you know, still f obsessed with uh, Marxism and communism now I always have to see is there's a little bit of controversy on the right over the term cultural Marxism. And when conservatives use it, they use it in an almost autistic fashion, like saying that like the Frankfurt School is the direct, you know, all these leftists are directly listening to Horkheimer and Adorno and Marcuse. And they're like, they've been plugged into the Frankfurt School. And there's this grand conspiracy that's been extending for the last, for almost 100 years with the Fra Frankfurt School starting this off with cultural Marxism. And a lot, some people on the right are right to question and be like, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff seems more to emanate from Cold War liberalism and actually what we've seen mainstream liberals were promoting in the 1950s and 60s. You know, there was a great thread, which I tweeted out on Wednesday uh, by this liberal New Republic writer. Uh, I'm not even beginning to try to pronounce his name. He's an African immigrant uh, who was showing off all these newspaper clippings from the from the 60s and 70s, where it was showing that these like very liberal publications were saying a lot of the same things that we sit, that we're seeing in our current cultural war. And, you know, these were definitely not Frankfurt School trained Marxists or postmodernists or anything. These were diehard Cold War liberals who are like, white racism is a grand neurosis that we have to use uh, countless hours of education and training to eradicate. And we're seeing a lot of that rhetoric today. I don't think, you know, cultural Marxism is a, is a worthwhile epithet 
to say about the left, you know, it's like your cultural Marxist. I think it's like fine to use it that way, but a lot of conservatives want it. They want to trace this whole ideological genealogy and there's this grand conspiracy theory and it all leads back to the Frankfurt School when a lot of this stuff is rooted in the post-war order that liberals and even a lot of conservatives were supporting and now it's gone haywire and it's not really the fault of the Frankfurt School. Not that we support the Frankfurt School, but it's a, it's a little silly to see this grand conspiracy theory. Right, trying to pinpoint one very specific intellectual movement for, you know, and, and, to, and to blame that particular movement for all of the issues that we face today is a bit, uh, it's, it's a bit reductionist and it's, yeah, like you said, it's not, it's not even correct. Yeah, and the Frankfurt School was not responsible for the worst excesses of the civil rights revolution. It was like liberals themselves, like the, like the Warren, the Warren court were not Frankfurt School trained intellectuals. You know, they were standard issue liberals at that time, you know, Kennedy and LBJ were not Frankfurt School trained intellectuals. And, uh, and same with, like most of the people that I don't think Obama, you know, they were always trying to claim like Obama's like a secret Marxist. Like, I don't think so at all. I mean, he's like a standard lib. And yeah. I think that like, it's not as exciting. Well, it's the same with the left. The left always has to call its opponents Nazis and fascists when like nobody is. It just excites their base more. But the difference is, is that in our society, Nazis and fascists excite more people or inspire more hatred than communists. I mean, communists is, uh, it's growing to a point where younger generations don't have this, you know, the negative connotations that boomers, Gen X, or silent generation, the older people have. Like, I mean, as a millennial, and, you know, we're fellow millennials, millennial identity movement here, uh, you know, there's not like, the negative connotations. It's like something that you saw in 80s movies. It's like, oh, well, they're villains, but they're not really around anymore. I guess they killed a lot of people. I mean, even with like people always like say that like they killed a lot of people, but it doesn't register in the same way that Nazi war crimes do. I mean, for a lot of, large part because our education system, of course, treats, uh, teaches far more about Nazi war crimes and there's far more movies about it. And people like say like, you have to take these lessons today these are very relevant to our current situation when in a lot of ways they're not um they don't do that with communism it's not pervasive throughout the culture so a lot of people are complaining about communism they really think that they're you're arguing about something anachronistic even though it's the same with you know the left you know crying nazi at everything that they don't like in our culture nazi just carries more weight it matters more to the culture uh world war ii is the grand historical event of our time it's the only in some ways it's the only historical event that's ever happened according to some pundits and it and everyone tries to relate contemporary issues with what happened then so it just carries more weight and a lot of the right tries to use communists as a counter to that and it doesn't work Well, you could, for all we know, Scott, you could be part of the uh, cultural Marxist conspiracy, and you could be getting paid <laughs> by uh, Soros to to that's cover true, up. That's true. That's true. I that could be getting Adorno paid to and, say that cultural Marxist. <laughs> well, um, uh, Mar kind of Soros is it was inspired. As some people have pointed this out on the. He's like his chief influence is Karl Popper, who was a liberal. He was definitely not a Marxist. Like uh, Karl Popper was a strong liberal, and that is you know. The Open Society Foundation, that's named after a Karl Popper concept. You know, he was definitely not a Marxist at all. And he uh, he didn't, you know, well, he, didn't like he was a Nazi. Yeah. <laughs> well, Soros, yeah, Soros is definitely a Nazi. I don't know. Hold out his own Popper. people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, they, they always, like, even with that, the right has to, even when they realize that they, you know, they realize that communism doesn't carry the same weight, they just have to go to Nazi. It's like same, the same. You know, they all say that Antifa are the real fascists and they'll even put them with like, they're the suc the succeeding organization of the Klan because the Klan also wore masks. And I was like, a lot of, a lot of people wear masks throughout time. You know, it's not, wearing masks isn't necessarily what makes them similar. You know, going on a similar topic about, you know, bad conservative or really dumb conservative talking points is that Republicans are finding a way to support statue destruction as long as the statues are of Democrats. One of the many conservatives who made this point is Texas Rep Dan Crenshaw. Crenshaw tweeted Thursday that he is proud to support the, the removal of Confederate associated statues from the Capitol because they're Democrats and Republicans won the Civil War. 
this is historically brain dead because there was Democrats also fighting for the union and you know, the, it wasn't, and there was wigs on the Confederacy. It's, it's just very stupid. I think most of our listeners would agree with that. Why do Republicans always make these stupid arguments? I mean, we've seen this uh, several times when like, oh, the Democrats are trying to hide their racist history by taking down a Robert E. Lee statue. Ha ha, we got you this time. But nobody is convinced at all by this. Yeah, I mean, what it is is more, uh, it's really just more of the same what we expect from conservatives at this point, and that is that they are looking for any excuse to rationalize uh, going along with whatever insanity the left is at a particular point in time. And if they can spin it as actually this is a conservative thing to do, it's conservative to support these statues being removed, uh, then that accomplishes a few things. A, it frees them from any responsibility to meaningfully oppose the left. And B, it allows them to feel as if they're they're, you know, they're the real progressives. They're, you know, they're they're getting they're with the times. And uh, but I mean the consequence is, is you end up trading your principles, you end up trading what actually matters, the things that you're supposed to be defending for you know, short term uh you know uh, you know for for electoral gains that may or may not you know manifest so it's yeah i don't even think it's like for electoral gains they're not clearly getting any electoral gains right. it is a way to rationalize these developments that they have no control over cuz if they were trying to defend this they don't have a language or any rhetorical weapons to defend these statues besides like well it's history they can't really say like well, these are, this is our heritage. They don't want to say that this is our heritage. They'll just say, well, like people learn from history by seeing a Jefferson Davis statue. They don't want to say Jefferson Davis is a hero anymore. It's the same in, with the Mississippi, you know, state flag when they were changing that. Republicans there who were proudly flying the flag and defending it then decided, hey, this Mississippi flag, which of course uh, used to feature parts of the Confederate flag, well, oh, this is a Democrat flag and Democrats, we're take, we're now going to make a Republican flag. It's like, you idiots were like defending it five years ago, the same very people. And now they're trying to get, like do this like way of like, oh, it's actually a Democrat flag. And it's a way of, as you were saying, it's, it's a way of rationalizing radical changes that they feel that they cannot counter or stop. And they're just trying to rationalize it as a, as a conservative victory when it's not at all. It's basically saying that their constituents, grandparents, great grandparents are no longer welcome in contemporary America and that their heroes should be wiped away. And they're just saying like, well, uh, the Democrats are trying to hide it. You know, there's a Republicans and conservatives have a kind of it's like race realism but the only two races are republican and democrat and they're not changing their the their eternal archetypes like democrats in you know 1830 are the same today that they're like it's a it's a timeless print it's a timeless people and you have not changed at all they're the exact same people like they really think that nancy pelosi's uh, ancestors were the ones <laughs> Um, defending slavery and fighting in the Confederacy when she's like Italian, they weren't even here yet. And it's the same with me, uh, several other Democrats. While they think that if you're like a Republican now, like you embrace that your people and that heritage, and now you're the uh, direct descendant of Abraham Lincoln. And it, it's a very weird concept. And the left does not have this at all. The left does not have this type of idolatry for its own party. Like they just view the Democrats as a vehicle for, as a useful vehicle for their own ideology and their own agenda items. Republicans actually believe that like, like the Republicans are a people that are, have been the same for generations. We must preserve our, a, a future for Republican children. <laughs> like it, It's something that they, that you're, that defines you and your characteristics. And then they've been unchanging since, you know, the beginning of the Republic. Um, while, de well, you know, for Democrats and liberals, they're fine with praising like past dead Republicans, but there's, you know, this real resistance among Republicans and conservatives to praise any past Democratic president or hero. And even when I was, you know, I tweeted out t today, I was saying that, you know, people like Crenshaw would happily replace Thomas Jefferson. People were trying to say, no, 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 no. Thomas Jefferson was a Democrat Republican. That's very different from Democrat. They cannot admit that any of the founders may have been Democrats because that would 
wipe away their whole uh, anthropo or historical anthropology of American history. Yeah, and I wonder how much of this they actually believe in. Uh, there's, I'm sure, many of them. At the very least, the naive, though likely well-intentioned supporters of people like Dan Crenshaw and others and Dinesh D'Souza, right? <laughs> Some of these people might actually buy into it, but I don't know if the people at the top who are promulgating this really how much they buy into it. But yeah, it is it is very absurd, and it's just so insincere when you have when conservatives don't have the backbone to say what they really think and to say what really needs to be said and to tell it like it is, then they end up right doing these, these rationalizations for going along with the left and this totally bizarre history, engaging in totally bizarre historicism to try to claim you know, the Democrats are the real racists and stuff like that. I'm reminded of your tweet, uh, what, what's his name? Madison Cawthorn. He was the uh, the young <laughs> crippled yeah, uh, yeah, candidate yeah, in, 24, in, 25, in Kentucky, yeah. and he was talking about how the Democrats uh, removing their own statues, and maybe I I forget the exact tweet. It was something going along with the statue uh, removal, calling you know these Democrat racists for doing that. And you pointed out, you know, this guy touts his you know multi generational history in Eastern Kentucky, you pointed out that this yeah, guy, Western, Western, Western Kentucky, Western, Kentucky. Or Western, Western North Carolina, and he oh, yeah, would have right. likely been, uh, his ancestors his, were like, totally Democrats. <laughs> yeah. They were, his ancestors were definitely Democrats and people always make that. It, it's like, and Southerners are the weirdest ones about this because even ones who will like admire the Confederacy will also, you know, subscribe to this weird anthropology about the, about the, Democrats first Republicans, everything bad was like Democrats. It's like your ancestors were a hundred percent Democrats if they lived in any because like the Republican Party did not exist for several for you know most of the 20 for like the first half of the 20th century in the South. Like, unless you were black, you were there was no way you were a Republican in in in, in like 1930 South. So like your ancestors were definitely Democrats or voting for Democrats at the least. And these idiots will just like say like, oh, the Democrats are trying to have their history. It's like, no, it's your history that they're trying to hide. Like there is no like re secret Republican history for the South unless you're, you know, black <laughs> or, or we're a scout or we're a carpetbagger. And, and Madison Cawthorn has always insists that his like family has been there since I believe the revolutionary era. So they were definitely Democrats. Um, you know, I know my family was like in the South, they were they were Democrats, so maybe that explains how I'm how I'm so racist. Wow, you know, it's like yeah, the Democrat genes are coming in. You know, we'll we'll have like a they'll like hire a scientist to study Democrat genes to prove that it actually causes racism. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, it's Democrats yeah. Democrats are are it's pro science proves Democrats are more predisposed to racism. Uh, these are all ideas that they would see. It, it's so stupid, but it's a way for them to you know as we're saying rationalize it also gives them some way to you know totally resist the democrats uh, but it doesn't convince anybody and they still think that like telling blacks that uh democrats are the ones who supported slavery and secession and segregation and and yada 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 that that'll convince them and, and blacks are just like oh well like that was like 100 years ago today is today and uh, Democrats give me more stuff than Republicans, so I'm going to vote for Re I'm going to vote for the Democrats. And this is an idea that hasn't really cracked into the skulls of conservatives and Republicans. But you know, speaking of cracked skulls, you know, Portland right now is a war zone, and you know, it's really causing a lot of controversy in our country. Uh, Antifa and BLM continue to assault the Portland federal courthouse every night and wreck downtown stores. Federal agents do battle with them instead of local police. This has prompted cries of fascism from libs and neocons. And everyone is going crazy that the fact that we would have federal agents trying to arrest and hitting with batons, Antifa are trying to destroy a federal courthouse. Pat, what do you think of the Portland situation? Well, it's not particularly surprising. We know that Portland and uh, perhaps to a lesser extent, Seattle, much of the Pacific Northwest uh, is defined by frequent uh, recurring Antifa violence and destruction of property. Portland seems to be about the worst. Uh, there are other parts of the country where it's pretty bad too, but Portland definitely stands out. And yeah, I mean, amid all of the insanity of the last few months, it 
you know, I, it's it's you could forgive someone for not being too clued into every particular city, but when you know, whereas with many cities, I would say most cities that have experienced unrest and and perhaps mass violence and destruction of property in the past few months, uh, most of those have subsided in in the last few weeks. Portland continues to rage on, so it's it's really just more of the same up there. Um, but it is it is particularly noteworthy just how long it's lasted and the fact that it doesn't show any signs of abating anytime soon. Um, and I saw that uh, the Portland mayor, uh, Portland mayor, Ted Wheeler got mace or uh, yeah, he got, uh, I got, I guess hit by tear gas last night by federal agents up there when he was, I guess they're protesting with the people destroying the city, trying to break into the courthouse. Yeah, he was and... expressing uh, solidarity with them, but the protesters <laughs> kept harassing him and throwing bottles at him. And yeah. at one point that somebody, <laughs> they're using leaf blowers to uh, blow away the tear gas. And somebody put like a leaf blower in his face and began blowing, you know, hitting him with it. <laughs> and he had to retreat into like a, like a city building with his like bodyguards, like scuffling with the protesters to protect himself. And he went on about how like, oh, this was a totally peaceful protest. The federal agents caused this entirely. They antagonized these peaceful protesters. This is all the federal agents' fault, and this is bad. And then after, right after he interviewed, like the, all the protesters began throwing bottles at him, and he had to like retreat into a building and let his security detail deal with the protesters. And it's like the, these people, they could be stabbed to death by the protesters, and like with their like blood skirting out of their mouth, and like well this is Trump's fault. Like they were peaceful protesters. Like I was stabbed by right wing extremists. Like they cannot comprehend that these people are not peaceful. They refuse to admit that there are riots going on. There was even a liberal meme uh, that they're trying to pass around this week, which it's not working anymore with how bad Portland is, is that they're claiming that all the violence happened in that last weekend of May that there's not been any violence or rioting since, which is just boggles the mind because in Seattle, you had Chaz where they took over, you know, an entire part of downtown and there was, uh, and there was battles with police there. There's been statue destruction all over the country. Uh, you know, there's been several bouts of violence in cities worse. I mean, the worst rioting, of course, nationwide happened in that last week of May, which that was the same week that George Floyd died, you know, Minneapolis was burning. Uh, Atlanta was having trouble. That I mean, I mean, of course, Atlanta around that Wendy's where Rayshard Brooks, uh, <laughs> the great hero Rayshard Brooks, lost his life. Uh, they're seeing lots of violence there, lots of gunfire, lots of gang violence. It, that's you know hurt, you know, it exacerbated the riot violence is already occurring. You know, there, but there's, will insist that there's no violence going on. And they, even in Seattle, when they took over da that part of downtown, and, you know, Trump and Republicans were like, what's going on in Seattle? Why aren't you guys doing anything about this? This doesn't look good. The mayor went out like, they're having a summer of love. And of course, when the, you know, white Antifa there like began shooting blacks who were trying to, uh, invade their territory, then they're like, uh, and they were seeing like videos of, the protesters beating up journalists and stuff, then the mayor quietly like sent in the police to clear it up. But she never took back her summer of love tweets. And we're and we're gonna just keep seeing this. Like, you know, Chicago and all these other cities are seeing like their violence skyrocket, and they cannot blame their antagonists in the police. They cannot blame their coddling of these minority communities who just want to cause chaos. They they'll just like say that this is Trump's fault or as AOC was saying that they're that they're wanting bread that's why they're stealing shoes and uh, and setting courthouses on fire and shooting people it's like this they're just trying to feed their families even though when you know the unemployment benefits right now being provided by the federal government are pretty good and you shouldn't be able you shouldn't be stealing food for right at this moment um, depending on your circumstances of course but they have to rationalize this and even when they're confronted with you know, violence and these people burning down city streets, they'll just sit there and they'll blame Trump. They'll blame the federal government. They cannot blame these people. They, they, the BLM and Antifa are entirely blameless and they can do whatever they want. This is the definition of anarcho-tyranny, which if you were a normal citizen who decided to, you know, 
get in a scuffle with them, you would face like serious assault charges. Or if you're trying to drive your car and you had to like swerve around them, you'd face uh, felony assault. Um, but if you know, if you want to tear down a statue or throw a Molotov cocktail, a federal agent, you're just a peaceful protester. Yeah, that's basically what it is. And I mean, the whole charade of Ted Wheeler going out there and professing his support for these anarchists who are blatantly destroying the city he's supposed to, including government buildings, the city he's supposed to be. And they hate him too. Well, yeah, they do hate yeah. him. But the, I, I, think it, I think it's just so, uh, it, it's so fascinating that he still, still feels the need to go out there and voice his support for them, voice his opposition to President Trump. And I mean, that really just shows how power is wielded in this country, right? Just as you said, it's a narco tyranny. If these, if the rabble out there didn't have the implicit, if not explicit support of various elites, right? Big corporations, influential nonprofits, NGOs, politicians, um, you know, the most powerful, obviously the media, most powerful institutions and individuals in the country then he wouldn't feel the need to do that. But the fact that he does, right, that just kind of reveals how things, how things work. And these people, right, so, so again, are these, does that mean that these neoliberal institutions and individuals are looking for the dictatorship of the, the proletariat? Are they interested in installing anarcho-communism? No, that means that their push for the centralization of power you know, sees something to be gained from having these gutter punks out riding in the streets and destroying property and, and things of that nature. So. Yeah. And one of the factors that is helping these riots is the media coverage is that they all like, you know, they're all the same as like Ted Wheeler, as they'll say that there's like a largely peaceful protest. I think one of the most famous examples is that there was like an MSNBC reporter in Minneapolis and there's a building burning right behind him. And he's like, this was largely a peaceful protest. <laughs> it's like there's a building that's engulfed in flames right behind you. And there's like a peaceful protest. And they did that with the same with Chaz. There was like a, several times where reporters were outside and like people in Chaz were trying to assault them and like were hurling insults in bottles. And like, yeah, we, we've only seen peaceful interactions here. This is entirely peaceful. Right. As they're doing their news report, it's like a water bottle is like careening past their head. <laughs> uh, you know, they'll, uh, so they'll just lie. And they're, and they're even doing this with like the defund the police movement. It's like, while we're seeing like crime rising, you know, to levels we haven't seen in 20 or 30 years, you know, they're still going forward with it. And like the media is saying, well, maybe defunding the police will help de-escalate this, will actually reduce crime because what's causing all this crime is they're seeing all this police antagonism and there's over-policing their communities. And once they don't, like they're just being triggered by police and once they don't see police around, they'll stop committing crime, which I mean, that's a bet they can take, but it's clearly not working because I mean, police presence is being reduced in these and many of the worst parts of the of these cities a lot of police are just quitting their jobs because they're like why am i doing this anymore if i'm just going to be sued and you know hit with like felony charges just for doing my job why do i want to do this job anymore and everyone hates me it's like i i can do better things with my life and you know we're going to see this play out and they'll just come up with the most ridiculous rationalizations for this because they cannot they cannot undermine the moral thrust of Black Lives Matter. And by saying that, you know, they're acting too violent or that, you know, actually, I mean, this also goes to the point when Minnesota's governor lied and said that all the violence in Minneapolis was caused by white nationalists. They cannot blame leftists for this. So they just went to their favorite boogeyman in order to get like a, you know, result out of it, of getting people to care. It's like, this is actually caused by white nationalism. So it, it exculpates blame from the actual people committing the violence and then puts it on the boogeyman who then they can, you know, use more state power against and actually take action against the rioters and say, just say that they're white nationalists. Um, and they'll continue to do this uh, over time. They'll just lie. And they have the power to lie. Um, as we've seen with like media outlets claiming that, you know, going to a Black Lives Matter protest doesn't cause coronavirus yet. Like eating at a restaurant outside is causing hundreds of thousands of people to get it. And we need to shut down the whole economy except for protests in order to stop the spread of Corona. So, you know, we'll, 
the lies will only get worse as election season ramps up and the violence will likely get worse as well. But we'll see more people like Ted Wheeler go out to the protests and insist against all evidence that there are no rioting going on. But a lot of Americans, unfortunately, support what the protesters are saying. 93% of Americans support police reform. The majority of Americans support Black Lives Matter, but there is a slight decline among whites for the, for the movement. But the most like interesting fact or study that we saw this week cam comes out that 50% of Americans think our country is racist. 51% of whites agree with that statement, and 66% of women agree with it. Ben Shapiro said he was devastated by this result. How did you react to it, Pat? Were you devastated and appalled that 56 Americans would think that America's racist? Uh, I, I don't know if I'd say I'm devastated. I'm certainly uh, a little disheartened, but it's again, it's not it's not particularly surprising given the demographic trends in this country, given the fact that the ruling ideology is decidedly progressive, liberal, whatever you want to call it. So the fact that more and more people are buying into this stuff isn't is isn't you know it's, it hasn't it hasn't totally destroyed my my world. Um, I also don't know how <laughs> actually uh, upset about this Ben Shapiro is, but um, because let's I mean let's keep in mind he has has is on record as saying that you know actual racists, real racists. No, I think it was legitimate racists, um, which implies that there are illegitimate racists out there. But he said that legitimate racists uh, deserve to be to be hunted and you know to have their their jobs lost and whatever else. But yeah, it's just it's how these things go. You know, when you have these big moments of cultural change, as we've seen in the last few months, I think most people are going to go along with it. There is going to be a counter reaction, but. I don't think, uh, you know, that we hear of the silent majority and whatever else. And I think that's somewhat of a cope. I think there are lots of people out there who are growing increasingly dissatisfied with the direction of the country, with Black Lives Matter, with Antifa, clearly. And yes, these people, due to the state of soft totalitarianism under which we live, these people can't come out openly without risking and, and we've seen many of them do that and they pay the price and that creates an example for other people to shut up about it so yeah there are many people out there who are not happy with the way things are going but the idea that those people are the majority um i don't yeah maybe a silent plurality or a silent i don't know <laughs> a significant portion of of the population but si like like there's this huge majority of people out there who are against this I don't think it's the case. This country is changing. Um, and I think I think it's kind of a cope. Yeah, I know, but I actually would slightly disagree with you on Ben Shapiro. I think he actually is horrified by this because they believe that racism is an un-American feature. It's a, something that is a European import, that there was never racism, real racism in America, and that the majority of Americans always rejected racism. And this country is fundamentally anti-racist. And they build, Ben Shapiro and other conservatives build their ideology around this concept. And to see that fit, the majority of Americans disagree with them that, no, America is racist, they're like, what? No, no, you have to see America as good and, and the greatest country ever. We're the exception, American exceptionalism. Like, how dare you believe this? And this does shatter their worldview and that, and it also, they also like to insist, as you were pointing out, that there that most Americans aren't buying into this left wing garbage, which, you know, that their own point is invalidated because a lot of these conservatives, I believe Ben Shapiro has mentioned that since systemic racism is real. Uh, if he has not, several other prominent conservatives have said that systemic racism racism is real and Republicans must do something about it. Um, which if you're saying systemic racism is real, then that would mean that America's racist and its foundations are racist. And you cannot be upset when uh, the American population takes the logical you know, step and says, OK, well, America is racist country. You can't do anything about it. And they, they have too much, <laughs> too much cognitive dissonance going on for them to really have a coherent worldview and a coherent answer to this. Um, of course, I'm not, you know, appalled by it or shocked by it. I mean, the media tells Americans every day that there's systemic racism and blacks, if they just step outside their house, like a SWAT team will be there to mow them down. And that there's all these innocent blacks who are just being murdered and lynched. 
by both police and white racists that, you know, they've created this whole conception of how America is. So it's no surprise in that like people who get their news from the newspapers and the nightly news would think that we're a racist country. You know, everything tells them that we're a racist country from the university's education to the mainstream media. And this is just the natural result. I mean, I'm, I'm in some ways, I'm surprised that it's not higher. Uh, you know, in the poll that was taken, it was an NBC News Wall Street Journal poll. They mentioned that an AP poll from 1988 said that 55% of Americans thought that America, you know, had a racism problem. But it was considered a very different, like, I don't think that Americans then would have treated racism as something that the, the majority of people who were saying America was a racist country or had racism were not thinking that you know, in terms of systemic racism, that our roots are racist or the foundations are racist, they would just say that there's a lot of racists in our country, which, you know, say what you will about that, that is something very different today where they think that, uh, you know, all our institutions are fundamentally biased against non-whites and we have to have a radical transformation to end this this injustice. Um, so I, and I, th I don't know if conservatives what to do in this situation because they do, they, want to appease it and coddle it to a certain extent and they want to change their views and like Ben Shapiro is like oh you know police racism is real it's a problem we need to deal with it and then you know when it goes a little bit too far you know they're made very uncomfortable by it and they don't know how to respond um they could just say like America is like the freest like least racist country in the world at the same time, they're saying police racism is a major threat to our country and we must do something about it. So they have to pick or choose and they're uh, trying to have their cake and eat it and it's not really working out for them. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that Ben Shapiro and his ilk, do they do value the conception of America being kind of an anti-racist nation. Um, as I, I think that's that's a necessary part of their worldview, and if that if that perception of America dissipates, then yeah, their whole their whole shtick is is kind of invalidated. So I think you are right about that. And it goes to like uh, conservatives are defending the mo the cringe musical Hamilton, which I would never put myself to ever listen to. Like I already hate musicals in general. Uh, listening to like a hip hop musical about the founders is like is like a bridge too far. I'd probably try to I'd probably kill myself after the first three minutes of it. Um, but they're trying to defend it as like this great thing because it teaches minorities to love America. But now the left is turning on it because they're like the the left is like you're whitewashing all these racist white men as like as like black and Puerto Rican like hip hop artists who who are and the only white character or the only white actor in any Hamilton performance is the is King George uh, the third which indicates that they were fighting against a white nationalist country which you know doesn't really purport to history. Um, so the conservatives are defending it as like this is the real anti this is how we treat anti-racism is that we imagine that the american founding is something that all people can see themselves in because we now have this musical where they're 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 rapping and, and they're black and and hamilton and hamilton and george washington are cool and this is black kids don't you see and they're all like the black kids are like uh no these are a bunch of dead white men who own slaves and wrote things about how we're inferior to white people so no we're not going to believe that and there was a great tweet by um, Yasha Mook, who's this horrible neo-lib who writes at Slade and some other places about how America can choose the anti-racism of Robin DiAngelo's white fragility, or they can choose the white uh, anti-racism of Hamilton. And the left and the mainstream media are going with Robin DiAngelo's book, uh, which is the number one seller right now. And she's making, breaking in millions, telling white people that they're racist, even though she's a white person herself. Um, great scam she's running, but it's working. And now that's like the, our nation's religion. Uh, while Hamilton is being put to the side, it's gonna, I mean, in five years, we're all gonna see Hamilton as the lamest thing that has ever happened. I support that. And it'll just be like goofy conservatives who are just like, we have to defend Hamilton. We must uphold Hamilton. We must show th that the new Americans are just as American as the Anglos. And it's just not going to work. And, you know, conservatives are having a tough time 
understanding that immigrants and blacks and other non-whites are just not going to see themselves in the founders. They're going to see them as racist white men. And they're going to they're going to exploit America. I mean, they're fine with America as itself. It's a way for them to make money and to uh, gain power. But they're not going to have this hagiography or have the same hagiography about this country that conservatives do. And conservatives don't know how to deal with the situation. You know, Hamilton is not the answer. Pat, do you like, Pat, Pat, I'm wondering if Pat I'm, is a big fan of Hamilton. It's a thing. I'm staying Dude. quiet. Yeah, I'm staying quiet here. I'm a, I'm a big Hamilton fan, and, you know, I don't uh, want to. Sorry for offending you. You know, you've been probably been like, yeah, I love the part where he's like, immigrants get the job done. And they for, <laughs> totally ignore that Hamilton wrote how we should have, like, an extremely strict immigration policy and shouldn't let uh, hardly any immigrants in because they're going to come in and, like, corrupt our country with foreign ways. But like in Hamilton, it's turned into he's turned into an immigration booster who thought that immigrants were superior to the natives. Which, I mean, yeah, uh, Hamilton was technically an immigrant of English ancestry. Right. <laughs> he was a Protestant who immediately fit into our, you know, the colonies. He wasn't exactly coming from Ethiopia, uh, but they turn him into like, oh, he's just like modern day immigrants. Uh, it's like, no, he was not. And he was like a strict immigrant. He was an immigration restrictionist. And he uh, wrote some actually based things on that topic. But they that's how they make they they're trying to appeal to liberal biases. But even that won't save Hamilton. Well, I just think it's look, I might not agree with the politics of it, Scott. I just think it's a great, you know, as far as the arts are concerned, it's just a fantastic musical. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I might not agree with what they say, but I'll fight for their right to say it. So. Yeah, same, same. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of fighting for people's right to say stuff, you know, moving on from Black Lives Matter, we need to talk about Uyghur Lives Matter. And no, it's not Uyghur Lives Matter, it's Uyghur. <laughs> Some, there's been a few, uh, you know, ironic posters out there who've tried to say that I've been, when I say Uyghur Lives Matter, I say Uyghur Lives Matter. No, it's, it's Uyghur. Don't you dare try to put words into my mouth. Uh, that's a warning to the irony posters out there. So final warning. But anyway, drone footage last week captured China loading up blindfolded Uyghurs onto trains, which drew widespread Western condemnation. But China may have stumbled onto an interesting way to defend its Uyghur policy, bringing up white genocide. The Chinese ambassador to Grenada said claims the declining Uyghur population amounts to genocide is like saying declining white birth rates is a genocide. <laughs> I guess they've been listening to White Rabbit or something. But how do you yeah. think this line will work out in the West, Pat? Uh, how do I think what will specifically will work out? How well do you think that they're complaining if like the Chinese ambassador or Chinese officials saying that them saying that the Uyghur population is declining due to genocide or oppression is similar yeah. to saying in the West that white declining white birth rates is due to intentional genocide from its government. How do you think that line will work out in the West? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to be too well received. Uh, you know, even though he does, I believe in those tweets, he does say that he just says, and we all know that's not happening right in, in, uh, relation to white genocide. So I don't know if he was being coy, if they maybe do think that that is happening over there, or if he's just trying to press, he knows which buttons to press to get under people's skin over here in America. I mean, you know, he, again, he did say that I, it's I think not it's happening. Like a genuine miss under our lack of awareness of, of like how the West work. I mean, they've like ambassadors have like done about like how like violent black uh, neighborhoods are and how they like should avoid them. And he's like, you have so much crime, you must avoid it. And even when they were trying to support Black Lives Matter, like there's some Chinese video that said all lives matter. And it's like, that's the Black Lives Matter considers all lives matter now a hate crime. So that's clearly not yeah. going to work on the messaging. They really, I, I think that it like, we're so crazy that China cannot even figure us out. And they're just like pointing out that this like might work, but like they don't, they can't comprehend like, like you have a declining white birth rate and you're clearly demographically, you know, you're bringing in immigrants to demographically replace them. And, you know, Western media, when they complain about what they're doing in Xinjiang, or I'm probably not even pronouncing it right, but that's where all the Uyghurs are, or in Hong yeah. Kong, where they're they're sending out ethnic Han Chinese and mainlanders to these areas to demographically swamp the native population. Western media outlets, like liberal outlets, will just like report this as like how terrifying it is, while like 
at the same time, like celebrating it in the West. Like, yeah, we're replacing you. But the great replacement is a, is a conspiracy theory. And I just think the Chinese can't really like comprehend how ludicrous this is. Like, yeah. <laughs> like even with the, there's a, there's a viral interview that happened with the Chinese ambassador to the UK. He was like on BBC and was trying to defend it. And he really had like no way to defend it. Cause he's like, he had no language. He was just like, look, the, the Uyghurs are, are happy. They're having a happy life as he's like watching these guys who are like <laughs> handcuffed and blindfolded being loaded up on a train. He's like, their life is great. <laughs> it's like, I don't know how that's working. Um, I've tweeted this out before that I think that what the Chinese could actually figure out how to counteract like all these worries about it is to say that one, the Uyghurs are white and they're, and they're racist towards the uh, non-white Chinese. And that while, and what's worse is how America treats its black population, that the real crime is police, American police violence against African-Americans. And if they did this, first off, the Western media would not say like, what does it matter if the Uyghurs are white? Like this is still oppression and ethnic cleansing. They would not go to that regard. They would insist, like violently insist that the Uyghurs are not white because they don't want to defend like a white people from being oppressed by a non-white people. Like they don't, they, they would put them on a media back foot where all the articles would be outlining how the Uyghurs are non-white, which would also undermine their whole claims that race is a made up category. It's like, who's to say the Uyghurs can't be white? What if they feel that they're white? Like why, why can't they be white? And then they would just go to these uh, you know, resurrect uh, like Madison Grant and Lothrop Stoddard to defend mm. their point that the Uyghurs are not white, that they're Asiatic. Um, and second, if they were, and if the Chinese said that the that's what happening to blacks is far worse than what's happening to Uyghurs, the media would not know what to do because if they said that's what happening to, to the Uyghurs is worse, then that would totally undermine Black Lives Matter. Yeah. They do not want to get in that argument at all. It would entirely put the media and the Western leaders on a back foot. And they would just like be stumbling around. And it's like, uh, uh, well, like uh, police racism is bad, but uh, we need to worry about the Uyghurs. And if they just did that, like, and, and they would probably get Black Lives Matter leaders on, their, on the record. It's like, yeah, that's right. Like what happened, police stopping us is far worse than, the, and stop and frisk is far worse than being loaded up onto a train. Like they would make this argument. So I think, but the Chinese like could effectively weaponize woke culture to their benefit. But I don't think the officials really comprehend it or know how to use this. And this is, uh, I mean, it would be a very amusing and entertaining, but it's like a good thing that they don't know how to do, use this because, uh, you know, in the future that can mean very bad things. And I don't necessarily, um, you know, want like all of, Western idiots like supporting China are their point of view, but they don't really know how to effectively weaponize it. So it is like in some points good, but if they did learn how to weaponize it and figure out what motivates our journalists and our leaders and how to portray their own issues and terminology that they cannot resist or effectively refute, that like people would overnight stop caring about the Uyghurs because they, they, they would like you cannot say you cannot say that what's happening to blacks is less worse than what's happening to Uyghurs. You can't say that. I mean, that, and that's the fact of the matter. Right? You mean you could say maybe you can say it's equal, but you cannot say it's it's not as big of a deal. Yeah, it's a very interesting comparison. Um, I think my I mean my take on the Uyghur situation is from what I've looked into. Uh, everything that's happened there in the last few years it does i mean it does seem pretty bad <laughs> it seems yeah it, no it's, it's, it, it is it, bad like i don't like yeah nobody i don't think anyone will uh, will disagree that's what's sure. happening it's but bad, yeah my but... my my position on it is is the same as most other you know most things happening outside of the sphere of american influence is that i you know i just i just don't care it's like hong kong versus mainland china too it's not that i have aside there it's that i don't i i resent the fact that i am being forced or you know pressured to take choose a side as an american you have you know the media support coming out in support of hong kong and i get both sides i'm actually somewhat sympathetic to both sides i just don't want to have to care on the one hand yeah the fact that you have these multinational corporations going along with china 
is cause for concern from a free speech perspective, sure. But on the other hand, I, you're not going to get me excited over the prospects for a you know color revolution or regime change in Hong Kong. So it's it's the Americans have really nothing to gain from siding with with either with either uh, you know side in, in this particular conflict. And moreover, I would add that we have this. Our ruling class has been doing this for some time, and that's scapegoating foreign entities, individuals, uh, phenomena as the source of America's ills, right? It's, this goes back to the war on terror. Oh, we, you know, we fight them over there, so we don't have to fight them here. Uh, or, you know, this was, it's Saddam Hussein, he's the real threat to, you know, some guy in, in Columbus, Ohio's, uh, you know, safety and his, his, fa you know, his family's well-being. What you have is the ruling class just basically getting you to worry about stuff outside of America. And that includes the fact that the things that we need to be concerned about Right, the biggest and the most severe threats to the American people are at home. Um, so yeah. just this distraction, this constant distraction. Now China is becoming increasingly one, but only in in the you know in a regime approved way. Right, if you're if you're you know concerned about tariffs or something, oh well, that's never going to work, and you're probably a Nazi who supports Donald Trump. So yeah. it's just uh, it's also it's also tiresome as the the saying goes, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I just resent in general having to being expected to feel strongly one way or the other on this. So, yeah, and a lot of the arguments that they make to make us care about Hong Kong, it's different from uh, the Uyghurs because I mean, what's happening to the Uyghurs is far worse than what's happening in Kong, Hong Kong. Is that they use arguments of stuff that's already happening here in our countries to complain it's happening in Hong Kong? Like there was an NPR journalist uh, this week who was like terrified. He's like. Financial services are denying our financial like institutions are denying service to Hong Kong dissidents. Like how terrible this is. They're using political views as a reason to deny them service. And it's like uh, this is already happening in the West, as you as you you can attest. Is uh, AIM got removed by its bank account, <laughs> by its bank. Uh, our previous guest Martin Selner has been rejected by nineteen banks in Austria, and there's several other people. And if you and if you use the big picture of financial institutions, like very few people in the dissident right can use PayPal. Uh, Stripe, many people have been kicked off Stripe. A lot of people can't use Patreon or any or Subscribestar or any of these financial services that they need to survive. And yet the Western media will complain about Hong Kongers losing it because of their political views. It's like, this is already happening in the West. Like, <laughs> like I'm like, it's bad what's happening to Hong Kongers, but I'm worried about what's happening to our people more like that's already happening here and they, and they have to complain about like oh hong kong no longer has free speech it's like uh we really don't have that much in like the west and like the uk is like wanting to grant uh special exemptions a refugee status for hong kongers because they're losing their freedom and i was like uh the uk like throws people in jail for like facebook posts uh <laughs> Like uh, there's a like they they arrested a twelve year old for criticizing a soccer star. <laughs> like, right, like this is happening right. in the UK. Like what? Like yeah, it's bad what's happening in Hong Kong, but that's already happening in our countries. They, they there's no self awareness for a lot of these Hong Kong complaints, and it's like I you know frankly I'm worried about our own issues more. And neocons always try to, you know, create these sob stories. And it's not really just like neocons, it's liberals in general, because woke militarism is the one guiding principle of our nation's elite. And they always use these sob stories about like, oh, the Taliban is, is oppressing women and in Afghanistan, that's why we have to stay there. And Saddam Hussein is oppressing his minorities and that's why we have to topple him. And, and Assad, you know, he does terrible things to, uh, you know the the Sunni to Sunnis, and they always use these stories. And it's like you know what, bad things happen in the world. We don't necessarily approve of it, but we have bigger concerns. And there's not really like a general like solution or policy agenda to do against China because a lot of the people who are the loudest voices crying over the Uyghurs and Hong Kong oppose tariffs to China. And it's like uh like. We're trying to hurt the Chinese economy that's oppressing these people, but for some reason, you must have your cheap iPhone. You must have your cheap products. You cannot put a tariffs on China. Uh, so what do you propose? It's like, oh, we, we issue a strong denunciation. 
yeah, that's really going to convince the Chinese to stop uh, throwing Uyghurs in concentration camps. So there's no real solution to this. And it's, um, you know, except for forcing the NBA to sell customizable free Hong Kong jerseys, which is really important to me. I, I demand my Los Angeles Lakers uh, <laughs> free Hong Kong jersey, um, which some, for some reason conservatives care more about than you know, Black Lives Matter than the NBA supporting Black Lives Matter. And I think for a lot of ways is conservatives are directing a lot of this nationalist anger toward China. Like when, you know, coronavirus is happening, I was like, you know, very supportive of the anti-China stuff because the, uh, the alternative was just to blame Trump entirely for this rather than like the whole government system we've had for the last 40 years that's outsourced our manufacturing in China and it's connected our our corporations and our economy so heavily with China, we're instead just going to blame Trump entirely on this. And that was the alternatives. And it's a lot of ways, it's like China was responsible for the coronavirus getting out. Uh, you know, maybe in our government didn't necessarily respond uh, as sufficiently as they should have to this menace, but we cannot um, say that China did a great job and you must blame China. And due to our independence and interconnectedness with China, that this whole virus became a problem for us. We have to admit that. But I think right now with like what we're seeing with the unrest and Black Lives Matter and Antifa waging war on our heritage, on our very society and trying to make whites uh, second class citizens, I think, you know, turning all of our anger and focus onto China is silly and doesn't address the real problems. And uh, I think the right, you know, it's like China is not good. We shouldn't want them to become the world power. But, you know, they're, you know, they're going to probably, you know, if like we're already saying that we should stay in Afghanistan to prevent China from taking over. It's like, you know what, every country, there have been several empires who try to take over Afghanistan. It's not worked for any of them. Let the Chinese take on Afghanistan. Good luck. You know, <laughs> well, I'm sure it'll have the same result as the Soviets trying to take it over in the 80s. So, um, you know, and that's yeah, we've, like, gained, we've gained virtually nothing from the you know what trillions of dollars we've yeah, spent in Afghanistan or something let them like, go get it you know entrench themselves in a quagmire it's not oh no they're gonna get afghanistan wow yeah, yeah no we must keep huge afghanistan. civilizational they're gonna, boon. they're gonna take away the women's rights there you know mm -hmm. they, they use all these cringe arguments so it, it a lot of this anti-china stuff supports the american empire's stupid foreign interventions and like stupid policies and and uh, and also a lot of this anti-China stuff is a lot of the arguments for the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that we must do this in order to uh, stifle China's economic growth. And we have to send all our jobs to the Vietnam and all these South Southeastern Asian countries. And it's like, uh, well, how does the American worker benefit from that? It's like, maybe that's okay. Maybe China's economy is hurt, but that's just supporting more globalism. So right. people need to keep in focus on what's important. And I think a lot of the China stuff is just a distraction. But, you know, moving on to our final topic, it's a it's a from we're moving on to the highly respected patron question segment of the show. And as a reminder, you can ask questions, too, if you sign up for the Patreon option at highly respected Patreon. This one comes from Tony. Tony asks, Scott, you talk a lot about polling in the election and say Trump's chances against Biden look slim, but the polls were totally wrong in 2016. Why are you believing the polls now? Well, I'm not entirely believing the polls, but I think you have to look at how the polls were in 2016 versus now. 2016, they would change rapidly over a week. Like there'd be one week where Trump was up one point by one point. Then the next week, Hillary would be up by five points. And then it just like, kept you know, changing. And there was many times where Trump was ahead on the real clear politics average. There's not been a time where Trump has been ahead of the real clear politics average. And for the past two months, Biden has been about, you know, eight to 10 points ahead in the average. This is a, just like polls, like one poll. This is the average, which takes like seven or eight polls that are released a week. And it's been a pretty clear Biden is doing much better than Hillary was in 2016. Now that doesn't mean that Biden's got this wrapped up, like the election's over, you should, you know, the polls right now mean how it's going to be on election day. A lot can change, but there are, this is a very different election from 2016 and people shouldn't necessarily believe that okay, the polls were wrong in 2016. That means they're going to be wrong again in 2020. 
you know, if you're looking at the messaging is Trump had a lot of energy and momentum in 2016. He was campaigning against the swamp, against the establishment that was embodied by Hillary Clinton. Now he's the incumbent president, though there's chaos in the streets. Coronavirus is still there. Our economy isn't doing so well. Like people are afraid. People want a return to normalcy. And Biden is promising a return to normalcy. And I've said this in podcasts before, is that Trump does has a serious messaging problem. Like it's not clear what he wants this election to be about. They're trying to do socialism first freedom, but like it's Joe Biden. If you ask Joe Biden if he's a socialist, he's like, no, I hate socialism. I love capitalism. That issue would be over in a minute. Uh, you know, they're trying to pretend he's Bernie because they know that Biden, they can't really fear monger about him. Uh, you know, they're trying to do stuff about like, this is Biden's America where they're showing all, all the chaos is happening. Now, that's a better message than socialism versus freedom. But right now, it's Trump's America. The better messaging they are trying to do is like saying like under Biden, there's going to be defunding police and robbers can break into your home and you call 911 and no one will answer. There's like a very effective ad where there's an old lady who's watching her TV and seeing chaos and then a robber's breaking into her home and she's trying to get a hold of 911 and it's like, sorry, we can't we can't reach you because we've been defunded. That's a very effective ad. So there's some ways that they're, you know, figuring this out. Uh, but Trump is, you know, he's in trouble. He needs to take this seriously. People cannot just say that right off the polls. Um, the one thing, the one thing, thing I will say in favor of the people who don't want to believe the polls is that the election or especially the polls and how they're assessing the election the electoral demographic will look may be wrong just because coronavirus you know that could impact people whether they want to go and more Democrats are less are Democrats are less willing to go to the polls than Republicans are due to coronavirus fears and you know the 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 turnout that the polls are expecting could be totally wrong and the demographics and also in battleground states trump's numbers aren't that bad you know he's leading at a lot of states people where you think he's going to lose arizona and texas m most polls still show him ahead or only one or two points behind he could still win in wisconsin um and he's probably definitely going to win in ohio and florida um you know he may lose michigan and pennsylvania but he can still lose those states and possibly win and there's even a chance he may win Nevada, depending on how coronavirus, or even Minnesota, if Minneapolis turns into uh, Mad Max Fury Road, like other Minnesotans be like, uh, Biden's going to turn all cities into like this. So maybe we'll vote for Trump. So there are some things that can change. Uh, but I think, you know, people need to be taking this more seriously about Trump's polling numbers and not being say like, oh, in 2016, he the polls were totally wrong. Actually, in 2016, they weren't entirely wrong. Like, the RCP average put Hillary Clinton a little over three points ahead of Trump nationwide. She won the popular vote by two points. So they're like a one point off. Um, you know, people just didn't expect the states to turn out how they were going to be. So, Pat, what do you think about that? Yeah, I agree. I think people have not critically compared the polling data from 2016 to 2020. Yes, there were a number of polls that showed Donald Trump was was very behind Hillary Clinton all throughout 2016, some as recently as a few weeks uh, leading up until the election. Yeah, I mean, the one CNN poll showed Donald Trump at 3%. What was that? The week of the election, maybe the night of the election. <laughs> so yeah. uh, people, people are absolutely uh, justified in taking these polls with a grain of salt, but that doesn't mean you discount them all together. And again, as you pointed out, the polling is far worse uh, this time around than it was back in 2016. If you just go to Real Clear Politics, look at the average, look at the list of polls, national polls, and you, I don't think you can find a single one that shows that Donald Trump has the lead over Biden. You can find a few individual states where he might have the advantage, um, but they're in states that you would expect him to have the advantage. When it comes to national polls, right, the, the president is, is far behind. And as you said, in many in many of these polls too, he he has a, behind by double digits. Right, Biden has a double yeah. digit lead. So uh, there's a lot that could happen between now and November, but November draws ever nearer. And all of the strange, uh, you know, uh, unforeseen providential things that happened this year, as opposed to 2016, have worked out decidedly. Uh, to Trump's disadvantage. So I'm not, you know, packing it up. I'm not ready to move to Poland or something. But um, it, but at the same time, yeah, it's, it's I'm moving it's to Kazakhstan, by the way. It's not looking good. So 
Yeah, I actually have the uh, my Kekistan backup option if he loses. So well, well, I well, I, I, it, it's somewhere I'm going to go there. Yeah. Uh, rent is actually pretty cheap there. But uh, the right. one difference and another difference I want to point out is I've said I, you know said this before is that. You know, it's a very different feeling to this election is that Trump had these large rallies. There's a tons of energy. And even though a lot of people on the distant right were like, well, our sphere of Twitter isn't that excited. But a lot of the boomers are, but they're not able to express it through the rallies due to coronavirus. And they're, and the media knows that the rallies, you know, help Trump. And that's why when every, you know, in the Tulsa rally, they warned that anyone who goes is just going to die. There's going to be a mass like deaths. It's going to be like the Black Plague plumbing. And that did lower like numbers to a degree. And Trump, you know, is worried about filling up his auditoriums and he doesn't want to have these rallies. And he knows that it's, you know, not the best optics for, you know, to have these rallies if there's like a coronavirus upsurge. So he's not having that same energy in the, like this, you know, upstart revolution that he had in 2016. But at the same time, and, if, you know, this is also something I want to say before, but I need to insist, you know, for the people who are like, oh, you're being blackpilled. Or, some people actually think I'm being cocked if I'm like saying that Trump might win. So it depends on your uh, listener's <laughs> stance. But one thing to consider is that Biden has like hardly any enthusiasm for him. Like the enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton was, well, People complained about how there wasn't much enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton, but the enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton in 2016 was like Obama in 2008 compared to Biden. Like nobody is excited on – nobody on earth is excited to vote for Biden. And many people, if they think that they're going to get corona if they go to vote for Biden, will just stay home and be like, well, the polls are telling me Biden's got this in the bag, so why do I need to risk my life or to go and get <laughs> – to go and vote for Biden? So there are some things it's like I don't think and the Biden infrastructure isn't as strong. He's not raising n nearly as much money as Hillary was. You know, there's even with coronavirus, there's problems with getting, getting out the vote efforts. Um, so there's still this election still in play. Um, the polling could be wrong. Uh, but if it's still if it's still like Biden by nine or 10 points ahead in October, um, you know, I think, you know, it's 98% certain that Biden will win, even though people will complain. The New York Times said that Hillary had a 97% chance. I think this time it's a little bit more accurate. But that is all the time we have today on Highly Respected. Pat, you've been censored a lot, as we've said before. Uh, big tech is oppressing you. So how can people find you and support you? Sure. Uh, so I can be found on Telegram, t.me slash Patrick Casey USA. Uh, additionally, I, well, I'm on Parlor, uh, Patrick Casey USA. I don't Parlay, know. actually. <laughs> is that, is that what it's called? It actually, it, no, it actually, it, what the dumbest thing is that it's a, it's a site dedicated to boomers, but it's a French word and it's pronounced Parlay. But of course, none of its users call it Parlay. Yeah, they all I've never it heard parlay. it called <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's trying to be a little too highbrow for probably the average uh, person who's who's going to use it. Uh, yeah, I mean, at, I think it's at Patrick Casey USA on there too. I don't really use it that often. So yeah, Telegram also D Live. I stream from seven to eight thirty p.m. Eastern Monday through Friday. Sometimes on the weekends too. Um, and that's dlive.tv slash Patrick Casey. So. That uh, that mostly does it. Uh, I may or may not be on Twitter, but if I am, I'm flying under the radar, so we won't uh, go into uh, into what my my at my username would. Okay, well, we won't be, dox so. your Twitter account on here. That's right, right. we won't. But I'm, yeah. I, but anyway, I'm thanks for coming on. Um, we appreciate it. We'll have to have you on again. Uh, maybe you'll have your Twitter account back again. We'll have to yeah. see. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on, Scott. Yeah, thank you. And until next time, stay respected.